I uh, have to correct you as the first thing I do. Uh, I have my office in Finland, but I am Norwegian. <laughs> but it doesn't make things easier. <coughs> uh, I will use the opportunity after sitting for some hours now to walk a little bit around. So if I'm standing in front of what I'm going to show you, just point at me and I will move. <coughs> Since I'm representing the Northern Dimension Partnership on Transport and Logistics, first I need to spend a little bit of time telling you what that is all about. <coughs> the Northern Dimension is a policy cooperation between the European Union, Iceland, Norway, and <coughs> Russia, of course. We have uh, four different partnerships. One is about culture with the Secretariat here in Riga. One about health and social well-being in Stockholm. The environmental partnership is located in St. Petersburg and the transport and logistic partnership is in Helsinki, where I have my office. <coughs> um, in our partnership, we don't only have these four original partners with us, but we have all the Baltic countries, as well as all countries surrounding the Baltic Sea as members. Latvia is taking over the chairmanship next year, so we have a perfect opportunity putting issues of importance to you on the table to discuss in a wider context. <coughs> That was the formalities. And then we are moving on to uh, <coughs> the basics. This is an interesting picture from many points of view, and it might look a little bit confusing. But when we are speaking about creating hubs, and we are speaking about freight and cargo to move, uh, we always need to address the market and the potential. Inside this small circle in the right corner, there is living more people than outside. Think a little bit on that when you are speaking about markets and potentials. That's what I call a market. <coughs> and you all also know uh, Maslow's pyramid of needs. What does every human being need as a basic thing? Then you need shelter and you need food and you need water. That is also what they need in China. And the population is growing, we have heard that, and they are aging. This is an interesting picture <coughs> uh, showing how the climate change will move the most productive areas in Central Europe where we are doing agriculture today up north. How will that affect our need for transport and how we are going to develop a transport system we are used to transport most of food and perishables from the south to the north. Maybe we have to do it otherwise in the near future. There is a second effect also of the climate change. Just as confusing picture as the previous one. Uh, but let me explain. What you see of the red thing down in the south Arctic seas, it's where the krill is living. That's the food for the fish. And with the climate change, it will move up north. So it means that the major fish stocks in the world will also move up north. And also there, we will have some effect on the transport infrastructure that we need to address the basic needs that we are looking for, food and shelter. Uh, I forgot to mention that the world's last biggest freshwater supply is the Baik Baikal Sea in Russia. So it's important for us also to have a good dialogue with Russia if we are going to survive in the future. <coughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, you normally don't see the world as it is. Uh, you see the world as you are. This is how they are looking upon us from China. It's a little bit difficult to orient yourself on this map because everything is upside down. And that is maybe some of the approaches we need to, to take into account when we are talking about and developing transport solutions for the future. Also in Riga, because the Chinese are also looking this way. <coughs> I think this is more one of the most frequently used pictures showing the Belt and Road Initiative that President Xi was launching some years ago. Uh, this is a schematic drawing, not showing all the co <coughs> connections, but the important thing is that it is one overland connection, and you also have the maritime Silk Road. I think that uh, this is probably a picture that you 
like a little bit more also in Riga because it's more detailed and it also shows the connections into Riga. But the problem might be like uh, the professor here earlier said that uh, Riga is not alone. China has been visiting Helsinki, Tallinn, Riga, Vilnius, and in Poland and in Germany. And uh, for those of you reading media like I'm doing, every time there has been a delegation, the flag is raised and saying that we are going to be the most important hub on the road connections to China, no, the, the railroad connection to China. And, and that, that's where the challenge is. Who will be the one in the end? <coughs> but it's one thing that we used to very often also in Central Europe to forget all about that China is uh, not playing in only one part of the world, they are playing in many places of the world. And in uh, January last year, they launched their, uh, no, actually it was January this year, they launched their Arctic strategy. And suddenly one new line was emerging on the map. The Arctic Maritime Silk Road. Russia was fast on the ball and they created a common project which they called the Ice Silk Road. Moving cargo along the Northern Sea Route. This is made possible, of course, again, due to climate change. This summer, China has been shipping five commercial big ships through the channel, <coughs> uh, delivering cargo to Central Europe. And while we, ladies and gentlemen, are standing here speaking, they are moving cargo along the Northern Sea Route. This is an old Sovietic map that I've picked up somewhere because this is not a new corridor, it has been existing forever. <coughs> this vessel is one of eight. Everybody knows the Merck Shipping Company. They are one of the biggest in the world. They have built I eight ice-class container vessels, each one able to carry 3,600 containers. This particular vessel is, while we are speaking here, on its way from China to Europe with 3,600 containers. How many trains do you need to fill to have 3,600 containers? It's quite a few. <coughs> but I doesn't say this to scare you off with your ambitious plans, because there is still a lot of possibilities connected also to this, even if you don't see them immediately. This is custom purpose special built vessels to resist the ice, they are thicker, they need more energy. The best solution for them is as soon as you get out of the ice you need to go to a port and you have to reload and transport. We had a visit of the Chinese Vice Minister for Transport in Helsinki some years ago. Uh, he was speaking on a conference and he spoke 20 minutes about how China intended to use the Northern Sea Route. But he said one thing, an important thing, and it is extremely important also for Riga. We need well-developed ports in the north, and we need good connections to the European transport system. That's where your opportunity comes. <coughs> China uh, and EU is trading for more than 3 billion euro per day, so we are not sm talking about small volumes of trade. We also know that 85% of China's trade is transported on sea. And China and the Vice Minister said when he was also in Helsinki that 20% of this freight should go through the Northern Sea Route by 2030. And 2030 is not so far away. So I think it's important that also Central Europe, and in particular Riga, is also looking up north, not only east-west, because there is a huge potential Riga is lucky because you are well connected to the Russian railroad system. The Russians are building a huge hub in Yamal, where they have all the oil and gas reserves. This is a multimodal hub with connections also to the Russian river system. And they have rail systems there. Chinese interests are planning to build a deep water port in Archangels in the White Sea. And uh, the Murmansk transportation hub is under development. And all of these hubs are connected to Riga by rail. The problem might be that under the current political 
situation, it's not easy to develop good products using these lines. But I think we have to. Otherwise, we could actually risk being bypassed. <coughs> Let's have a look on how um, the European Union is supporting this. This is the picture of 10T corridor network. For those of you who know what it is, this is where Europe will give their priority with funding for infrastructure in the coming period. Uh, <coughs> You also happen to know that there exists some other maps. You have a 10T comprehensive network and a 10T core network that is a little bit more dense and also includes some of the other connections that will be interesting. But the problem with this map is that 90% of all the funding coming with the connecting Europe facility goes to this. And it's very difficult then to develop any new corridors taking into account the changes that is happening around our corners. <coughs> um, in NPTEL or Northern Dimension Partnership for Transport and Logistics, we have this map in which we are putting priority on. And the European Commission is also a member of our, our organization. This is a place where we actually could contribute to developing new connections, taking into account these new connections and do something to position us to take advantage of this. <coughs> uh, so far, we have no projects that we have been supporting financially from Latvia. I hope to see some in the future. There is another option. We were speaking also about uh, Rail Baltica. Rail Baltica will go all the way up to Tallinn. Uh, and as you know, Finland and Estonia is talking about building a tunnel under the water between the two cities. And that will extend the railroad also into Helsinki. And the Finnish Minister of Transport has just started a project building a railroad all the way up to the small Norwegian town of Kirkenes, which I happen to come from. And they are currently doing a study to check if this is feasible or not. There is no secret, ladies and gentlemen, that, that the Chinese is found also there. As well as they are in the ports on the Russian side, as well as they are in the Bieli Rust uh, <coughs> logistical hub outside Moscow, and we heard also here in the Great Stone. So China is everywhere. We only need to find a way of working with them and Russia to the benefit of all of us. <coughs> By speaking so late in, the, in um, the afternoon, as the previous speakers also said, you have been taking all my points. So uh, everybody has been speaking about autonomous vessels, self-driving cars, but nobody has been mentioning containers transported with drones. I was first with that. <laughs> Everything is possible as long as you dare to try. But uh, going a little bit back to trains, I have read somewhere that the Latvian Railroad is looking into the possibility of powering your trains with hydrogen. That's good. Germany has already done it, and, and the good thing with hydrogen when it comes to environment is that the only thing that comes out is water. So uh, I hope you will continue doing that, because that's a step in the right direction. Norway, the country I come from, most of the cars are electrified. Some are saying that by 2025 it will be illegal to sell anything else but electric cars. I'm not so happy with that, because I'm driving a diesel car. <laughs> But uh, I hope that one day maybe I will be replacing it with a fuel cell car driving on hydrogen. <coughs> Up in the left-hand corner, I came across an article where President Putin in, in Russia was announcing that he was going to build a hyperloop to Beijing. And he has actively put down a lot of projects studying this. It's still a concept. But uh, if you look into the details, it will be 24 hours from Moscow to Beijing with a Hyperloop. Uh, last year I was on a conference with then, then Minister of Transport in Russia, Mr. Sakhalov. He has retired now, but he was closing the conference we were attending and speaking about Arctic transport infrastructure, saying that imagine what the Hyperloop could do to Arctic transportation. So Russia is on the ball, are we? At least we have to have a look into this. And I've also included a picture of the Finnish icebreaker, which they recently has been taking into use, which is powered by LNG. LNG is also what Russia is using for powering the new trains. The things is happening fast, and we need to keep up with this if we are going to catch up with what is going on. 
We heard about drones, they could be used to a lot of different things. I heard that Latvian railroads is using them for inspections, and that's good. And they are used to any kind of things. Uh, but what you also should maybe look into, if you haven't looked into it, is how could we automate our cargo handling? Because we all know that as soon as a human being takes in a piece of cargo, it is not that efficient and it costs a lot more money. It's used in container terminals. The air cargo companies it used it for stuffing containers. Should we look into what we can do to automate something else? And like everybody else has been saying, also blockchain is extremely important. And in particular when it comes to transport, uh, because it could make custom clearance of border crossings much more easy. And the whole thing is that when you have a blockchain signature, nobody can fake it. And that is also something that customers could trust, making things move faster. I won't go into details about the speculation that also blockchain could mean the death of the banks. But it could. <coughs> uh, we were briefly touching up of Internet of Things and data communication. Uh, I happen to have this slide also, which I borrowed from a friend of mine in Finland, because Finland has been putting this high on the agenda. And when we are speaking about drones, we are speaking about automation, we are speaking about self-driving cars, autonomous vessels, they are all part of the Internet of Things. But we need some basic connections as well. So Finland has proposed to build a data cable along the Arctic route as well as crossing the continent. And this is also important infrastructure, also for Riga, if you're going to develop this place as a most important hub in the Baltics. <coughs> because of all the new things that are coming, they need to be able to speak to each other and we need to be able to communicate with the markets, which is in Asia, real time. <coughs> Uh, since everybody else had used all my arguments, I will close by um, summing up and, and, and uh, looking into what, what, do we, what do we actually need to do to develop uh, the best hub in the world in Riga. Yeah, the answer is here on the picture. What you do need is connections in all directions. You need connections to the north and to the Arctic. You need connections over the land bridges to Asia and China. And you need connections to the Scandinavian countries over the ocean. And for sure, you definitely also need well connections to the Euro Central Europe. Because the Scandinavian countries is not a market big enough for being attractive for channeling a large transport volumes through this region. But Europe is seen from an Asia pers perspective. And combining all of these solutions could make Riga the perfect place. And if it's done right, and the solutions from the freight forwarders are packed and wrapped good, and it's marketed well, and you deliver what you promise, Riga could be the mother of all hubs. Thank you very much for your attention. <coughs>